if the Baltimore Ravens truly do go down the path of getting younger at wide receiver and giving their young guys the chance to perform, is that the right decision? All that and more come up next year on this episode of Locked On Ravens. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire, here with you as always on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. Thank you so much, as always, for being here and making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every day. Free and available on podcasting platforms. That includes an audio form wherever you get your shows, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, also in video form on YouTube, where you can like this video and subscribe to the channel over there. Five days a week of Ravens content, plus some bonus content as well. I think there'll be another bonus episode tomorrow as well, so be sure to check that out. Today's episode of Locked on Ravens is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning five of the bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. Here with us today, he he has risen from the dead. He's, he had a crazy Thursday, and I, I am pleased to have him back. It's Rocco DeSangro, Fox 45, the Ryan Ripken Show. Obviously, Rocco, it's been a crazy day. We're recording this early Friday morning, late Thursday night, as the Orioles just played. I got the little, you know, I, I went to the game. I got the little Orioles shirt going on, the little sweatshirt. Orioles won, by the way, dominant win over the Angels. But, of course, we're here to talk about Ravens. Rocco covers both Ravens and Orioles. It's been a crazy whirlwind day for you, Rocco. And I know with the Ravens, hasn't been a ton going on, but we do have some opinions to talk about, especially at the wide receiver position based off of John Harbaugh's comments about maybe going young there. Yeah, well, as far as the Ravens going young at that position, I do not think it would be a bad idea, especially if, especially if John Harbaugh kind of alluded to that. Uh, you saw what Zay Flowers did on the field last season. Um, his rookie season, he was tremendous. Uh, but there's a guy like Rashad Bateman who still has to prove himself out there on the football field. He, he truly does. So this is a big year for Rashad Bateman, regardless of what the Ravens end up doing with that fifth-year option. And it's going to be a year where he has to prove himself as a number two because it's no longer, okay, there's a chance Rashad Bateman could be our number one. That ship has kind of sailed. Rashad Bateman is going to be behind Zay Flowers on the depth chart when it comes to it. Zay is that one. He's established himself. Going forward, he's going to be Lamar's favorite target or one of his favorite targets out on the football field. And then Bateman, he's he's really got to step up this season and show the football world in Baltimore what he's capable of because he's under fire for the last couple of seasons here in Baltimore. I think some of that is justified. I think some of that is frustration with fans. But he's a guy who does have the potential to be a great wide receiver. Um, we just need to see him go out there and perform uh, to the level that he's capable of performing to. Yeah, and I think for a lot of people, the whole notion of going young, it kind of dates back to 2022 almost, Rocco, when Baltimore did that, and they essentially handed the keys to Rashad Bateman as their number one after less than a full season. They had Devin Duvernay be there too. They had James Proche, and then they essentially signed Sammy Watkins and said, here you go, here's your veteran. And it, it didn't work. Bateman got injured, Duvernay got injured, no one lived up to expectations, and it was a disaster of a season. But I do think the key there that you mentioned is Zay Flowers. It's a little different this time around. Now, does that mean Baltimore should not sign another veteran? No, I think they should sign somebody else. But my preference, you know, it would always be to go get the Cortland Sutton type, a number two type wide receiver. But for Bateman, that's the guy who right now the Ravens, they bring in Josh Reynolds for a visit. Now he signs with Denver. But even like the Michael Gallup, it seems to me, Rocco, like, and I've said this all week, Baltimore is not necessarily trying to go out there and find a guy to compete with Bateman and take away from Bateman in the snaps. It's more so a guy to compliment him. And I think fans are kind of in two different schools of fish with that in terms of, well, some really like that idea, others not so much. I think when the Ravens, one of their weakest points a few seasons ago, if, if not their weakest point, was the wide receiver room, and we looked at it, and then they drafted Zay Flowers. Zay Flowers has established himself as the number one, like we just talked about. Like he's the guy. And he had a season to prove he is the number one. And it didn't take him long to do so. 
just being a rookie and dominating and doing what he was doing out there in the open field with his yards after the catch, um, creating space against corners. His shiftiness is unmatched. So for Lamar to have that target right there, that go-to guy, that's it's I, I don't want to say security blanket because I don't look at Zay Flowers as a security blanket. I would look at Mark Andrews more as that because if stuff breaks down, downfield deep, Lamar always has Mark Andrews to throw to, but Mark Andrews is going to get his too. Now, now you're going to, you know, looking back at the season where, okay, did the Ravens need to bring someone in? It was, okay, can they rely on James Prochet? Can they rely on Devin Duvernay and Rashad Bateman? The answer at that point in time was no. That group was so inexperienced. They were too young and clearly they weren't talented enough. So the Ravens had to try to go out and bring in a 35 year old at the point in time, Deshaun Watson or Deshaun. Sorry, Deshaun Jackson. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That was a slip up. Um, to come in and to try to bolster the wide receiver room right there. And he did as best a job as he could at his age and where he was at that point in his career. And then going out and getting Sammy Watkins. Different scenario this time around. And you have that established number one receiver. And you can add guys. And you bring back a Nelson Aguilar, which I thought was great because he's a veteran. But can you continue to, to get younger? I know Nelson Aguilar is not the youngest guy on the team. Yes, you can. Through the draft, through free agency, through trades, whatever they feel is necessary to do. If they want to go younger, by all means, go in that direction and add to what you have right now. Yeah, I think there's a difference between going younger and just going young. And like that's all you have. And I think for Baltimore in 2022... I, I had said it before the season started. I said, this is a really big risk. They, they have they've Sammy Watkins. You have to, one, account for missed games there because of the injury history, and two, he's not the Sammy Watkins, that prime guy that we saw. And obviously it backfired. But if I had told you a year ago, Rocco, that we'd be sitting here today and talking about Nelson Aguilar being the steadying veteran presence on the Ravens, I don't think anybody, I don't think you believe me, I don't think, I don't think anybody would believe me here. I think it might have been, oh, oh, Dell really worked out. And that's the guy who it is, but obviously it didn't necessarily work that way. And now it's Aguilar, but you've kind of floated it a little bit about Bateman having it be a big year for him and having to step up. What, what, what's your general perspective on him right now? How in or maybe out are you on him at this point in his career based off of everything you've seen? I'm in the middle and I know there are fans that are just so far out on Lamar, or Rashad Bateman. Sorry, it's been a long day. I can't get names right right now. Um, so I'm going to do my best. <laughs> but there are fans that are so far out on Rashad Bateman that they're just done. They're ready to see him leave Baltimore. They're ready for this experiment to be done and over with. And they don't think that he can have a big season. I'm in the boat that thinks, listen, Rashad Bateman – Go out and prove what you're capable of, man. Go out and prove that you are a first-round talent, that the Ravens, they took a chance on drafting you and they thought you were going to come in and be that solid number one. Have that chip on your shoulder like you have in years past. But instead of years past where you had that chip on your shoulder for kind of no reason, I'd say, because you were a first-round draft pick, this year you have something more to prove. Like, he really does. So for Rashad Bateman, this is like a, a – put up or shut up here for him. Honestly, like I hate to put it like that, but that's like basically what I'm getting at as far as if, if you don't do it this year, it's like there's no reason to have a chip on your shoulder doing, you know, going forward if you can't perform at the level that everyone expects you to perform at. So this is a year where, you know, it, it's let your actions do the talking, what you do on the field and, you know, Stay, stay quiet about it. Stay uh, reserved about what you do. Like work in silence is what I'm getting at. And show, show the people when you come here in training camp, when you come here in OTAs, that this Rashad Bateman's for real and he's ready to have a big season. And I really hope that Rashad Bateman does. I'm, I'm really rooting for him because it has been a tough couple of years for him in Baltimore. Even your talk about the early season injury struggles he's had. I mean, first rookie season there, 2021, suffered the injury in training camp and then didn't really come back until I think it was week six against the Chargers. So he kind of lost out on that. Missed some time last year as well. So I think for Bateman, it's just about getting consistent reps with Lamar in the offseason and having a full year with him because I think we see the film and the reps of Bateman getting open and Lamar yeah. not being able to find him. We know the talent and potential is there just hasn't quite been there. But I agree with you, Rocco, where it's like, this is the year. 
I yep. mean, the fifth year option, we're going to get a decision on that. And I think it's what next month or something. So we're, we're going to see how the Ravens feel right now, but I'm not saying that that fifth year option is declined that he's gone. If he has a great year, the Ravens can obviously bring him back mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be shocked if they do, but obviously this, this, this has to be it. It's make or break here, especially yeah. if they decline that option, but you talk about getting younger and obviously you talked about the draft. That is an Avenue. The Ravens could explore. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, look, we, we've seen Eric DeCosta draft Marquise Brown in 2019, Bateman in 2021 flowers in 2023. Can the Ravens really invest four First round picks in six years of Eric DeCosta's tenure at the wide receiver position. Now, Marquise Brown obviously isn't in Baltimore anymore, but would you be okay if they took a receiver in the first round? Or would you rather have that go to another position? I think the receiver position can be so deep, and you find just like guys in the third and fourth rounds that end up being potential stars, like we've seen it before happen in the NFL. Whereas you look at corners, you look at O line, they might be like the starting caliber, um, so, some starting, some stars, they might be harder to get at that position at that point in time. And that's what the Ravens truly need right now. That's, you know, 1A and 1B as far as the priority lists go. For me, okay, if, you, if you're going to have those two, then number three, because you're counting 1A, 1B is one and two, then three would be the wide receiver position. I don't think the Ravens should go wide receiver in the first round of the draft. I really don't. If they do, you know, and, I, and I'm wrong, whatever. It's, you know, not the end of the world to me. People are going to roast me regardless. But I think with, with the crop of talent, with the players they need right now, having Derrick Henry now in the backfield, you want to be able to block for him. You don't want him running behind like a ragged, just like run down O-line with guys you're just trying to plug and play. You want established starters right there. At the cornerback position, you want it to be okay if – Marlon Humphrey goes down with an injury, knock on wood. You hope that doesn't happen again. Another guy can step up. Or if Marlon Humphrey's healthy and Brandon Stevens does even half of what he did, did last year, uh, performing at a, at a pro ball level, he had a fantastic season. Then you have three solid corners right there on top of having Arthur Millett back in Baltimore for the next two years. So those two positions, Kevin, first and foremost, I think the Ravens need to take care of first before – they start worrying about the wide receiver position. But that's the fun of the draft because Eric DaCosta is going to worry about all of those positions at once. He's not worrying about one at a time right now. Yeah, we know we know they're a best player available team too. So he, he could pull some random position that nobody even is thinking about right now out of his hat. And I think it'll be we'll happening. Back. Yes. Oh, God. I cannot even imagine the discourse. Ben Mason in the fifth was crazy. <laughs> Back in the first, well, I, I think it would break the entirety of every single social media platform there is. Unbelievable, now you're speaking, you're speaking into existence now. So yeah. if, if it happens, we know who to come back to. You'll, you'll be happy to know, though. That Sam and Joku came on this show yesterday, friend of both this show and the Ryan Griffin show. Yeah. And he agrees. He says the Ravens should not take a wide receiver in the first round. So you, you and Sam, that I wouldn't mind it, but I think, yeah, offensive line, corner, edge, and wide receiver are the four needs I'm kind of circling. But there are a couple needs I'd rather take over wide receiver at this mm -hmm. point. But coming up in the second part of the show, we'll talk more about generally John Harbaugh's comments as we have all week from the NFL Lotus meetings. Kind of wrap those up. Stay tuned. A lot to get to on Locked on Ravens. First, this show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney, whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed. It's time to go to Ansic on America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on points for as many lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Now, I have UConn winning it all, but my first Final Four team is out. UNC loses in a crazy game to Alabama. So, still got three Final Four teams in, still got my finals in as well, but... Big blow to my bracket with UNC losing. Let's visit family.com slash locked on and bet college hoops until they got done that. We're back to our second segment of Locked on Ravens with Rocco DeSangro. I am Kevin Ostriker. Rocco, we talked a lot about wide receivers, so let's move away from that a little bit and just talk about generally what John Harbaugh had to say. Now, the NFL owners' meetings first, it was funny, he kind of checked with the media and said, oh, did Lamar put anything out on Twitter? Because we know, <laughs> we, we know last year, Lamar was very, very timely Calculated. In, 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 in his tweet that came out in his trade request, which thankfully did not end up resulting in anything for him, but probably with a little bit of humor at the beginning there. 
But he did talk a little bit about the running back position and said, oh, yeah, you know what? I'd be happy to have J.K. Dobbins back. I'd be happy to have Dalvin Cook back. And we know the Ravens signed Derrick Henry, and we know what these things rack over. There can be some coach speak or GM speak, player speak. When these guys talk to the media, there's plenty of it that goes on. Now, I don't think it necessarily makes sense for the Ravens to bring back a J.K. Dobbins. It has nothing to do with his talent, the potential he has, but just you have Derrick Henry in there. And if J.K. is looking for a one-year opportunity to prove himself, it's not going to be a lot of snaps behind Derrick Henry or Justice Hill or Keaton Mitchell when he comes back. Dalvin, I could see if he's able to accept the fourth running back role after Keaton comes back. But I just, with them signing Derrick Henry, I would feel like a running back in the later rounds in the draft is a more realistic option than them trying to sign another veteran or them bringing back a Dobbins or a Cook. Yeah, I would agree with that, Kevin. And how about J.K. Dobbins, the report that he was visiting the Chargers yeah. mm -hmm. Thursday with a certain offensive coordinator that was here <laughs> in Baltimore for years, a certain offensive coordinator that he was pretty unhappy with after a certain playoff loss. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where that's going, but you know what? Maybe he's just like that close with Gus Edwards that he wants to join him uh, in L.A., kind of you know, rekindle their friendship and have the bus and JK back together again. But, but I, dude, I have no clue what that was all about and uh, kind of beats me there. As for the Ravens, I don't know if JK Dobbins coming back is the right decision for either side. I think both kind of need a fresh start from each other. It seems like that relationship has kind of run its course. If the Ravens did want to have JK back and JK wanted to, Come back to the Ravens, okay, by all means. But, you know, you have Derrick Henry. You have Keaton Mitchell when he's healthy. You're going to have Justice Hill. It's those three. I don't know what the snaps are going to look like for J.K. Dobbins in this offense. And if he's another guy who is trying to prove himself coming off of uh, not one, but, but a few significant injuries in his career, this is a big year for J.K. Dobbins to – maybe get away from Baltimore and go somewhere else and prove his worth elsewhere, maybe on a one or, or two year deal. Um, prove that you can stay healthy, prove that you can go out there and be a workhorse running back for a team because it, when he was healthy, it's, it sucks, man. Injuries suck because he was so good, but injuries were just killer. It's like one of those, like, what if, what if this player would have stayed healthy throughout his career? I think about that all the time with J.K. Dobbins and his career is not over yet, but he it's like he could have been that much better if he would have stayed healthy throughout his career in Baltimore. Yeah, I, I mentioned it a couple of days ago, and I think that with J.K., we talked about which free agency losses are going to sting for the Ravens the most. I think if Dobbins goes and balls out somewhere, it's going to sting probably mm -hmm. more than anybody else. And again, not because, oh, I – Wish he doesn't do well. Of course, it was the best for JK wherever he goes, right? That's not a question, but it's just like, well, it could have been in Baltimore if the health situation was just a little, a little bit different. So if JK goes somewhere, whether it's the Chargers or Dallas or wherever it is, I, I expect him to ball out if he stays healthy, but that's the key question. It's again, if he stays healthy. But then the edge position, Rocco, was one that a lot of people were talking about. Now, Jadavian Clowney goes to the Panthers two years, 20 million, up to 24 now. The Ravens, with their situation, just really couldn't be players at that type of money for a Jadavian Clowney, who played really well. I'm not trying to sugarcoat how big of a loss it is for mm -hmm. them, but kind of leaves a, a hole in an already very thin group where Adafi Owe, we saw flashes from him, but then it's David Ajabo, who's talented, but the injury history is there. And then it's guys like Tavius Robinson and Malik Ham. How concerned are you about the S position right now for the Ravens? Uh not necessarily concerned because look at what they did last year. Um, look at what they did previously, bringing in guys. They've never necessarily had trouble bringing in veteran edge guys to, you know, on one or two year deals on recent years, especially to help with that position. And there's a guy like Kyle Van Noy that, that is still out there and maybe they're going to pull him off his couch. Maybe they'll just wait another week and go like week right. four this year. Like Kyle, no training camp for you. You get the first three weeks at home, and then we're going to bring you in and really hit the ground running here. Um, but it's it's going to be interesting to see what the Ravens do in training camp and I guess how much potential they do see in these guys this year because it's a big year for Odafe Owe like it is for Rashad Bateman as well with that fifth year. 
um, option coming up, that decision they have to make on him too. And then Ajabo, injuries, another guy who injuries are just killer. And it's, I mean, before his NFL career even started, so it's sad because that you, you were looking at a potential first-round pick before his injury, and now it's a guy that is really struggling to stay healthy and to be on the field. And the hope is that he can be that guy this year. I know Dafe Owe and him, like former high school teammates, they were so excited. And talking to Owe at uh, the Open Stadium practice last year, it's like, man, like what are you and Ojabo capable of this season? Because that was like the one-two punch that Ravens fans were kind of excited for. It was like, okay, these two young guys can maybe lead the charge. Maybe we don't have to go out and get that season bet to bring in. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, fortunately for Jadavian Clowney, they brought him in. And fortunately for the Ravens, that was the case with Kyle Van Noy as well. Um, but I don't know if I don't know if trust is the right word, but I do think the Ravens right now at this point in time, they do need another veteran um, pass rusher, whether it's Kyle Van Noy, whether it's Kyle Van Noy and someone else, um, or whether it's two other veterans. I think we could see the Ravens if it's just Odafe Owe, if it's just David Ajabo, if it's just Tavius Robinson bringing in another one or two veteran edge rushers to training camp or early in the season uh, to help kind of um, not, not necessarily the morale, but just to help with the age and the veteran ability and the kind of been there, done that aspect with that group. Yeah. Now Harbaugh said that he was optimistic that one or both of Clowney and Van Noy could come back. So obviously Clowney off the board, Van Noy is the option and the other guys who are in for agency right now, Rocco, not necessarily super inspiring. I think Van Noy is kind of the prize of everybody. And after that, it's like, oh, well, this guy had a good year, but it was about five years ago. So we'll, we'll kind of see how the Ravens decide to address that. But coming up with the final part of the show, we'll continue wrapping up John Harbaugh's comments. Also talk about some of the rule changes that the NFL has implemented and how they could impact the Ravens. Stay tuned. We've got a lot to dive into on this Friday edition of Locked on Ravens. We're back. Our final segment of Locked on Ravens. Kevin Allstriker still here with Rocco DeSangro talking Ravens. Now it's after the Orioles. It's both big Baltimore sports crossover again. Went to the game. Rocco obviously was there covering it for Fox 45. Orioles win big in, against Los Angeles. It was a great, great day for Baltimore sports. But with the Ravens, Rocco, obviously with this being a Ravens show, we got to flip back into football mode. So with this one more comment I wanted to talk about with John Harbaugh before we get into the rule change aspect of things was on the offensive line. Now, the Ravens, they traded Morgan Moses away to the Jets. John Harbaugh said that they were tight cap-wise, and that's essentially one of the reasons they decided to move on, which, again, you can't keep everybody. It makes sense. Three starters on the offensive line is a lot. Now, Harbaugh mm -hmm. saying Daniel Falele is going to have a chance to compete for the starting right tackle job. He said Andrew Voorhees is healthy and ready to go. Where are you on the offensive line right now? And, and how do you think they fill out these holes on their line? Is it guys who are already on the roster? Are they going to draft a, a plug-and-play tackle in the first round? How do you think this all shakes out? I think they're going to draft a plug-and-play tackle in the first round. Yeah, like you just <laughs> said it. Someone on the offensive line that can fill one of those open spots that a Kevin Zeitler, a Morgan Moses, or a John Simpson left uh, when, they, when they left Baltimore. It's You need to bolster that offensive line. Because, again, there is a lot of youth and inexperience there right now from guys that haven't necessarily started a um, significant amount of games in the NFL. Now, you, you look at a guy like Patrick McCary, who's there, who has stepped up um, at, at both positions, both the tackle and the guard. And he's played some significant time over the course of his career. But is Patrick McCary going to be your everyday tackle or your everyday guard? I'm not sure. He's so valuable as a reserve guy because when one guy goes down, he can step right in and it's like nothing ever happened. Like most of the time, the transition is so seamless that a guy like Patrick McCary truly helps the Ravens um, on the offensive line. But you want some, I don't know, a sense of stability and someone that's going to be there every day, like a Tyler Linderbaum, like a, Ronnie Stanley, except on Fridays during practice and whatnot. Um, that's sorry, but you know, it's just, it happened. It happened. It's okay. It's okay. He's a vet. He gets his days. He does. But that is a, that's, that's what you want on your offensive line. You want guys that are going to be there, guys that are going to play potentially every snap and guys that are going to stay healthy. So 
I think the Ravens should go out and draft a good young offensive lineman in the first round or um, in the early rounds, because I think there is a lot of potential out there to, to fill, to fill that line in. And I, I'm not sure if I am sold on a Daniel Falele right now. I'm not saying he can't be great, but he's still young. He's still raw. Is this the season he steps up and, um, turns into a, an everyday starter in the NFL. I, for his case, I hope so. I truly do. But I'm just not a thousand percent sold on him right now. Yeah, and again, that's what the competition is for in terms yeah. of bringing guys in. Now, I will, and this is something I've been preaching forever. Now, if the Ravens do draft that plug and play tackle, you got to play them, right? The Ravens at this stage they need value from the draft picks. The first round is where you can, you know, you pick a guy there to be an immediate contributor. For the most part, I mean, teams do take developmental guys there, but with the Ravens. You want to take a guy who's ready to go. You know, yeah. you, you can you can still work for potential. I'm not saying that a first round pick, it's the ceiling. It's going to be you have to take the most NFL already guy in the draft, but you can't have an offensive lineman sit behind Ronnie Stanley at left tackle for a year or yeah. sit behind Daniel Falele. You got to have that guy be an immediate contributor. Now, I, I will to, to kind of wrap it up. John Harbaugh also said Rocco that uh, cooler heads did prevail, and Patrick Ricard is going to play fullback, not offensive line. There's <laughs> that that agenda always seems to come up every off season, one way or another. He's so good for them, though, in his role. Now, I know there are a lot of questions about just what his role is going to be, but you, you made the fullback comment earlier, so I thought I'd <laughs> I thought I rounded out it's, with that one. Like, yeah, it wasn't it. I think it was like last year. It was because he could have been like a cap casualty or just like a, uh -huh. cut, a you know a cut candidate at that point in time because we weren't sure in Todd Munkin's offense what the fullback position was even going to look like. So I think Patrick, Patrick Ricard, that's why he was like, all right, you know what? Maybe I'm going to work it with the offensive line and maybe that's going to be my calling, my position, and I could potentially get paid. But dude, wild times, wild, wild times at training camp. He was, uh, it's, it's nice to see Patrick Ricard, just the fullback position staying there where he belongs on um, pancaking people. Like he really truly loves to do. Yeah, and uh, we now know that uh, Derrick Henry also very excited to play with, with, with Pancake Pat, Project Pat over there. So it, it, it's going to be exciting for sure. I, I'm ready. Those two guys coming at you, I mean, with with, with my height and my stature, Rocco, I'd, I'd, I'd be – I'd be flying back 25 yards at that point. But in terms of rule changes, the NFL passed a lot of them, and we're going to see some different things going on now. I think the one that everybody's talking about is the new kickoff rule. And the Ravens have been known to be a special teams team, really ever since John Harbaugh came in as that special teams coordinator in 2008. They've been the team, I think, that you look at for special teams over the course of that tenure. And now we're going to see a little bit of a different way kickoffs are done. I know it was kind of piloted in the XFL a little bit where the kickoff will happen and players will be lined up pretty close to each other, right around, I think, what is it, the 30-yard line or so? And then that landing zone is right in the 10-ish yard line. Touchbacks now go to the 35. So crazy things going on. Does that benefit the Ravens in your mind? No. It's just like, it's. I don't. I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's just like I don't. I, you can I can say no, and then I'm gonna say yes. Like I, dude, I have no clue, man. If I'm Justin Tucker, my mindset is just boot the ball as far as humanly possible. Don't give anyone a chance to return it. It it does. It incentivizes these kickers to try to kick for touchbacks now because you're so close to one another. You're not giving you know the gunners and your you know, the kickoff team, the coverage team, a chance to fly down the field and make that tackle. And I, I get it. They're trying to keep player safety at the top of the list as far as the NFL goes. And I understand that. But the kickoff was such a special part of the game. In recent years, it's kind of died down. But you think of the Devin Hester kick return for the touchdown in the Super Bowl. Uh, Ravens fans, even more recently, what was it? The uh, Devin Duvernay 103 yard kickoff return. Was that, was that like the first play of the game against the Dolphins? I forget who that was against, but I think it was the last season. It might've been the opening kickoff, taking that back for a touchdown to get the bank rocking. Uh, whoever it was against, like that place was loud. It was awesome. It's like plays like that. It changes the momentum of a game. And now it's being taken away. I don't, I don't know. Like I haven't watched a ton of XFL. Like I, I've seen, I've seen the kickoff a few times, but I don't think I've ever watched with my eyes. Not that it hasn't happened. Um, I haven't witnessed it being taken back for a touchdown. 
I saw someone say something like, okay, it, this is big for the Jags because Devin Duvernay is there now. And I guess like when you're in that, when you have that much room to work with, I guess, because they're not going to be flying down the field and you can kind of make your decisions quicker. Um, Devin Duvernay, a guy like that is going to thrive, but maybe, okay. A guy like Tylen Wallace, who has a punt return, uh, for a touchdown last season, just a game winning one, which was incredible. Maybe he's a guy who's going to thrive because odds are he's going to be the uh, full-time return man. Now I would expect him to be, I don't see anybody else who would this season. Um, so, so we'll see. I don't know if it benefits the Ravens though, Kev. Like, what, what do you think? Cause it's like, it's really kind of uncharted territory, uncharted waters for me. So I'm not sure what's your take on it. Yeah. I mean, growing up, it was always, you know, again, you mentioned like the Hester return and, the NFL, I mean, when you talk about why they're doing it, I think it's more so for the player safety like you talked about, yeah. where obviously this lessens the risk of those high-speed collisions where you can argue the kickoffs were probably one of the most dangerous plays in the game just based off how fast those guys were lumbering down the field in those collisions that happened. Now, I think when it comes to the general rule where, you know, that landing zone is within the 10 and then you get guys to run, it's going to probably increase one, obviously it's going to increase the amount of returns. Because I think when you talk about the touchback moving from the 25 to the 35, yeah, I think kickers are probably going to say, all right, my guys are down there at the opposing 30 already. It's going to be a bunch though. It's going to be more so about, you got to win your block. You got to shed your guy and you got to be ready, but we're not going to really see as many big holes open up just like that it's going to be more can you beat your guy to the edge can you do so it's going to be weird it's going to be an adjustment these rule changes always take time for me to adjust at these levels just because i'm so used to seeing and you are too rap everybody these kickoffs be all right you kick the ball the guys run down the field you tackle so i think it's it's fine i mean i would have been fine if they didn't do it but i understand their reasoning now speaking of reasoning and player safety, the hip drop tackle, Rocco, I think has been the most controversial rule change the NFL has made in terms of them taking that out of the game and it not being reviewable, which is a whole nother can of worms. This one's interesting because it's very hard to define what a pure hip drop tackle is. I think there are a lot of tackles that aren't hip drop that look like hip drop, and I think it's going to be called that way at first. I think guys like, again, you see John Harbaugh saying he was all for taking the hip drop out of the game, but then you see the defenders. It's like Patrick Queen and J.J. Watt. They're saying, well, can't wait for the two-hand touch game we're going to play. And that's kind of the point where the NFL has made it so hard to play defense already in terms of you can't go high, you can't go low, you can't touch a quarterback here, you can't hit a guy there. And now you're taking this other avenue out. Obviously, the correct textbook form is you run through a defender, like Ray Lewis style, run through a defender, ankle tackles and that's how you do it but obviously the game is played so fast Rocco if you're a defender let's just say you know you're a guy fighting for a job and there's a guy coming at you are you going to let that guy run through you for a touchdown and lose your job or are you going to try to get him down any way you can try to be trying to be within the rules I just think it puts defenders in a tough spot I understand the player safety aspect player safety should be the number one priority but it, it, it's just a very difficult line that the NFL has to toe with this how do you expect defenders to tackle Derrick Henry? Honestly, got to go low. How do you expect defenders to tackle these big physical freaks of nature? It's tough. I'm, I'm not really for or against a, a hip drop tackle ban. It's a lot of players voice their opinions against it. Kenyon Drake, former Raven, being one of them, he said um, he injured his foot or his ankle re really severely on a hip drop tackle you saw what happened to mark andrews but then there's i think players like patrick queen i'm not sure if it was him or I, i'm pretty sure it was pq said something about it like um voice his opinion other guys have voiced their opinions like how how are players supposed to tackle how how like with that and with the roughing the passer rule i think the hip drop tackle is more severe and if you want to take it out of the game fine um, but then you look at the roughing the passer and what tacklers trying to sack a quarterback, like pass rushers, they have to go through. It's football is a full speed game. You're, you're not out there if you're not running full speed at someone, not trying to take their head off anymore. But if you're not driving your power, driving your weight into someone and trying to take them down and force that football out, 
that that has always been the point of football to first of all make your opponent feel it and second of all you're trying to force that football out and bring that person down by any means necessary and now football is it's the rules i don't know there's a lot of people that don't really agree with them there's some people that are, that are in favor of them obviously um if they weren't these rules wouldn't be changing but it's tough on defenders now man it really is it's um i guess one year too late for mark andrews though it's i mean if it was if it was banned last season could have been a different outlook for the ravens this year uh, with a healthy mark andrews throughout that playoff run but um i don't know man i'm really indifferent about it and i think it's tough on players as it is trying to go out there and tackle with all the penalties and the flags and um, everything that's called in the NFL nowadays. Yeah. I think it would have been, it would have been a little bit different if, you know, defense was still able to be played essentially. (laughs) This is what I'm trying to say, where if there weren't as many rules, policing defenders, if they banned this, it would have been like, okay, cool. There are still other ways you can kind of do this and do that, but it's, it's already such a tight game. These defenders play, you're making it even tighter and I, I th- we're going to see a lot more points scored, I think, because drives are going to be extended because of hip drops. And uh, look, that's what the NFL wants. I'm not saying it is solely because of that. Obviously, again, player safety should be the number one priority here. But again, we kind of talked about this on the Ryan Ripon show, Rocco, where it's would you rather see a 50 to 49 game like Kansas City, Los Angeles was a couple of years ago? Or would you rather see a six to three game? I think the NFL understands what, which is the better product. And uh with defense, it's just going to be harder to play it. So we're going to see what happens, but going to be interesting. I'll say that, but I appreciate you hopping on Rocco. Thank you so much for joining me. Please tell people where they can find you and what you're working on. I know you've been grinding out there. Well, tonight you can find me in bed because I'm about to pass out. <laughs> I'm about to be just dead to the world, just done. Because that, that was just like, I think I, it's, it's been like a crazy Tony. Can, can, you, kind of, can you outline your day? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can. If anyway, no one, no one's going to care about this. Nah, and people care. Anyone, Go ahead, let's hear it. Come on. <laughs> it was, uh, it was a crazy day. So like I, I might be asleep for the next like 12 to 15 to <laughs> however many hours, who knows? Got up at, um, went to bed last night at like two, two 30, woke up at five. Um, went to the grocery store at like six 20 slugged the first Red Bull. Oh, yeah. Um, and then I ended up getting over to Camden Yards at 6:45 had my first live hit at seven. Then we did another live hit at 7:30. Then we did another live hit at eight, and then one at 8:30, and then one at nine. And then I talked to Michael Elias one on one at 9:30, and then we did a hit at 9:50. And then uh, I think open open clubhouse for the Orioles was at 10. Went down there. Uh, Morgan was doing a lot with that. She was uh, handling you know the interviews, and I was kind of I just went down there to kind of listen and mingle a little bit 11 david rubenstein talks on the sixth floor of the warehouse um i think 12 brandon hyde spoke and then at like 12 30 the orioles had batting practice then i went over to pickles did not drink because i'm not allowed to i'm trying to keep my job um saw ryan saw zach said hi to them for a couple minutes. I was, I was stuck there. on the light rail, by the oh, way. Man. So. I was, I, I didn't even see you. So I wish no, I, I was stuck on the light rail. I was trying to get in and the light rail stopped. Packed in like a sardine at pickles. <laughs> Kevin. I was miserable. I was sober. I was miserable. I was like, get me out of this place. So I went back, but it was cool. It was, it was fun. And then, um, ended up doing live shots at four, uh, four, yeah, four, 15, five, 15, five, 50, six o'clock. Then my day at Camden Yards ended. Then I went, drove back to uh, WBFF, anchored the 10. They had me in the A block. So like a 10-15 hit, a 10-50 hit, and then I finished it up by anchoring the 11-30, and then we did a morning sports cast, and now I'm on with you. So it's it's been wild, man, but it's been fun. It's all part of the grind. Love it. Love talking to you. I was I was like iffy about hopping on here because I was yeah. like, always a good time, bro. We got to do it. Absolutely. So if that was not reason enough to go follow Rocco and his work, he is a grinder. He works hard at what he does. Links will be in the description down below. You can find him again, Fox 45. Also on the Ryan Ripken show, Ripken Rock. He's everywhere doing Ravens and Orioles coverage. So again, be sure to check him out anywhere you can find him. 
He's a good kid, as Ryan likes to say. That's all I have for you here today on Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, follow along. I also thought of a bonus episode for tomorrow and Sunday, so I'll be back here both. We'll have two bonus episodes this weekend. First, talking about the edge position, a little bit about who's available, and then we'll also get into the rule changes in a little bit more detail. So be sure to stay tuned, subscribe, follow along. We'll see you right back here tomorrow in a bonus episode on Locked on Ravens.